Hi, everyone. Welcome back to A Better Future Starts Here, a live weekly show brought to you by the American Society for the Positive Care of Children, otherwise known as American SPCC. I'm your host, Tracy Kawa. American SPCC is dedicated to improving the lives of children in the United States. We are America's voice for children, bringing the individuals and the organizations to ensure that children are raised in a safe environment so that they may become healthy, secure future leaders of tomorrow. Our goal is to bring you the industry experts who have the knowledge and the support who are dedicated to empowering children and families. Today with us, we are happy to bring you Sheil Bhuta. She is a holistic practitioner and intuitive counselor, a mental health advocate, and a children's mindfulness and EQ teacher. And for those of you who don't know what EQ is, it's emotional intelligence. And I'm gonna read you a little bit about this amazing woman. She's a survivor of trauma and she herself lives with multiple sclero sclerosis. She has traveled to, uh, to various countries learning different healing modalities. Her journey of healing herself is what has led her to become a healer and a teacher for others. She'll assist both children and celebrity athletes in alleviating their physical emotion and emotional pain, helping them to attain their healthiest normal. I love that, their healthiest normal. Her children's EQ program's main mission is to help children embrace their full range of human emotions so that they can retain their beautiful, or what she calls their beautiful empathetic nature throughout their life's journey. She she'll teaches children ages from four-year-old to high school. She teaches high school four-year-olds to high school students and the focus is always about giving permission to feel how they feel and thrive in exactly who they are so that they can find the same compassion and understanding for others that they encounter. Thank you for joining us, Sheil. It's so exciting to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for this incredible organization. I mean, like I love aligning with people who are dedicated to helping the youth because honestly like we've talked about this like let's work on children because we're doing preventative measures instead of damage control like right that's right and today you're here to speak with us on untangling trauma which is also the title of your new book that's due out this fall well, we're so ready again. I'm really excited about it. And we're going to, I'm so excited to put it out there because I just feel like we, we as society have strayed so much away from the healing process and we want quick results. And we think, you know, this fake it till you make it culture. And I, it's toxic positivity, right? Because not everything's happy and that's actually very positive. Like sometimes they say I'm positively sad and that's okay because that's what I'm supposed to go through in this moment. And it would actually be abnormal for me not to feel what I feel like. Yeah. And that's what life is. And it's about embracing that and my journey of going through the motions and realizing my happiness was on the other side of all the stuff that I was avoiding and I just needed to embrace it and address it and acknowledge it and how I untangled what I went through. And so I wanted to share that with other people. And so I'm really excited about to, about sharing that and bringing that book out forward. <laughs> and, and just for our listeners, the title today is referring to giving kids the infrastructure to manage their emotions because we see so much chaos and so much tragedy that occurs in society when emotions aren't managed. Right. People are, you know, there are people that are walking around like like ticking time bombs. And we've seen that with with people who go into schools and shoot shoot up the schools. So tell us, let's start at the beginning. How did you develop this passion that you have for children and families? I've always loved kids. I'll be honest, like that was something if you look at pictures of me from when I was four years old, I was feeding my two year old cousins and 
I was going through, like, I just always loved children. I felt, I, I don't think that I ever really truly grew up in this sense of that innocence. And that's what felt at home to me in my skin. And being around children just always made me feel more alive, right? It always reminded me what was important. And I could be having the worst day ever. And when I'm around kids, I'm like, oh, it's fine. Or even, you know, as I when I went through getting sick and being hospitalized, when I thought about memories with children, I literally felt just joy come through my system, even when I was hooked up to machines. And so for me, children have always been this happy place for me. You know, people think of the beach, people think of all this stuff. And for me, it was always children. And so I love being able to interact with them. And I feel like children's are our greatest teachers. And, you know, as a nanny growing up and, I actually, you know, went into the sports world and I remember telling my friend then, like, I missed my calling to be a preschool teacher. And I, I was for a little bit before I got sick. And I worked with foster kids and at risk youth. Mm -hmm. and, um, actually, that's not an appropriate word, underserved children, because you know what? They're not at risk, they're underserved. And so being able to help them really helped me actually untangle my trauma, like we said before, because when I was working with my foster kids, and when I was working with them, I was like, being able to acknowledge stuff that I wasn't able to acknowledge and seeing how I should have been responding to it and being able to work through them, through that changed my whole life. And that's when I started going into the journey of this is what I want to do and witnessing the shift in them, you know, the transformation in them when I love them and I allowed them to be. And working yeah. through these emotions that maybe I never actually dealt with. I'll never go through what a foster kid goes through, but that's how I started developing my passion because it was something that I realized like, Oh, this is why I was born. You know, when you, you have a moment with kids and I had kids that didn't talk for months and two weeks with me started talking and ex like yeah. explaining themselves. And I remember that was right when I quit sports. And I remember thinking the most, and it sounds crazy, but the most brag worthy thing I thought I would do was be on a field, like a professional field. Cause I wanted to be a sideline reporter, but it was like, no, like that didn't mean anything to me. It was a cool thing I did. Whereas this, the impact that I had, I was exhausted when I came home, but I felt like this is, this is why I was, that, this is why I'm here. This is why I went through everything that I went through. Yeah. As the, yeah it's needed me and I need them. I needed them, but yeah. this is what I want to do. So I'm sorry, that was a long winded. No, that was so great. I mean, you were talking, you said so many things that I'd like to unpack. So you said, cool, right? Being a sideline reporter, that is cool. And at the same time, I get it. You know, working with kids for you, it's just so meaningful. And when you said that you were four years old, and I wasn't sure what the rest of that sentence was going to be. But then you said you were taking care of two-year-olds at four years old. I was thinking, wow, she was a nurturer from the moment she was born. Yeah. Right? Like, you're just a true nurturer. I, yeah. There's different things that give different people purposes, right? And yeah. that's also why I'm so big on helping people feel their feels, right? Because you don't know what you're passionate about if you're, you don't know what you're emotional about, right? Those two things go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And for me, kids have always been this place where like I could see a kid and I'm like a baby magnet. People laugh at me because I'll go to the grocery store and I'll start talking to kids. Or even when I'm at doctor's office, I'll have kids sitting next to me and I'm reading them a book until like I go into my doctor's offices and they all laugh at me. They're like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. And people hate being next to babies on an airplane. I love it. I yes. put pressure points on babies because their ears are popped and I start playing games. I My friends make fun of me because I always have stickers in my purse just in case like a baby's crying next to me. Wow, well, what a great it, idea. It doesn't take up any room, right? Like I just have like this packet. My friend's like, it's chill, that's weird. I was like, no, but you never realize how much that mom or dad or whoever that caretaker is needs it in that moment. And you also don't realize how much of an impact these little stickers have on children. And so it's just kind of been like noticing that and then my journey of realizing how much I followed other people's path because I was following their excitement over my own and their validation over my own. But when I followed what made me joyful, my life started to like accelerate in the direction that I needed to go in. <laughs> sure, sure. 
I love that you were ca that you carry stickers in your bag. Listen, I was in DSW over the weekend and there was a woman with a little boy and you know, he's talking and looking all around and she's saying, don't touch this and don't touch that. And of course you're in a store where everything is new and it has tags on it. You want to touch everything. For sure. I noticed he was holding this little box and you know, we're in a shoe st store. I said, oh, are those sneakers for you? Because it was a tiny box. So of course they were for him. Yeah. And he said, yeah. I said, can I see them? He said, sure. I said, oh, those are so nice. Did you pick them out yourself? And he said, yes, I did. And I said, are they for your first day of kindergarten? He goes, oh, how did you know? <laughs> the wonder in his voice was so precious. I melted. And I just wish that we would all embrace children in that way. I love that you carry the stickers in your bag. And I think I'm going to adopt that along with puppy treats. So that I love I'm barking yeah. dog. And think about that moment for the kid, right? Like in that moment, he realized people are kind, right? He or she realized people are kind. And it's like it, for him to smile or her to smile, I feel like for them, it's like, oh, look how good it is to make someone else feel good, right? Everything we do has such a ripple effect and we don't realize that every single interaction we have is an educator, right? No matter what age you are, everything you do, that's a, an opinion in the person that you're interacting with. And so if you're able to be loving and kind for no other reason than to just be kind, you set this motion in that person's mind of like, Oh, I want to pay it for her. That was really nice when someone was nice to me. Or absolutely. Or even if they don't pay it forward and they realize that they're worth being kind to, you still fulfill your mission. And it's something as easy as having stickers in my pocket. That's it. So think about it. The mom was telling him not to touch anything, right? Which was almost like more apolo you know, that comes from an apologetic standpoint. You know, just stand there with your arms at your side, you know, don't be noticed and melt into the background. Whereas that validation that came from actually having that conversation with him. And it's so perfect, right? Because yeah. you accepted him and you validated how big of a deal it was that he made a decision and that he picked it out himself. And he has this brand new experience to go ahead. And I love that you said a place of apology because that is the greatest disservice that we've done to children is make them feel like they're living in a museum. And Neil deGrasse Tyson has this wonderful quote, and I'm paraphrasing because it was, you know, it was on one of the his shows or podcasts, but he was like, children are scientists. We're born scientists. We literally learn the world when we're born. And through being messy and through noticing how things interact with each wow. other, learning everything. I mean, I always think about how phenomenal, phenomenal it is that children learn language from nothing, from nothing. We're literally speaking alien words to them and they figure it out and they talk back to us and they're just these little sponges. Now, when you let kids play and absorb, they're now learning to learn through anecdotal research, right? Like that's research for them. They're experiencing it and embracing it. And when we let kids be dirty and messy, we yeah. teach them to love learning because it yeah. is learning. everything they're doing and observing is them taking in the environment. And it's so important to their growth at, or their trajectory. That's a part of them figuring out why they're here, you know? And so I love that you were able to notice that moment and give that to him. And it's not that parents are, that's not bad parenting. No, it's, there's no shame in that. It's just rewiring what's important. What am I valuing in this moment? Am I valuing the joy in the moment and the experience in this moment? Or am I valuing the structure and the quote unquote peace, right? Is external peace mm. worth sacrificing internal peace? Because every time you do that to a child, you're sacrificing their internal peace. And I'm not saying let them run like crazy, right? We, there's obviously, we teach them boundaries of society, essentially. But there is understanding what is really worth fighting about and what is worth letting them be kids they're supposed to be. Yeah, I, I love how you phrase that. 
about their internal peace, right? Because there are all of these mores and things that we should be doing or should be teaching our kids or that our kids believe they should be doing versus like that internal piece that, which ties into that intuition. Mm -hmm. So now they're conflicted. Do I go this way or do, you know, that society says, or do I go with the way I know to be true to myself, right? And, and the conflicted feelings that go along with that, which, which lead us into exactly what we're here to talk about, which has to do with trauma and our emotions. How are the two connected, Shio? So I love this question. Trauma, especially if you grew up in an environment where you had to keep it together, trauma doesn't have one set of motion to move through it, right? And so the way I want to describe this is if you break a bone, right? Like first you have to put it in a cast, right? And then you have a month recovery of rest, right? Like you don't want to move. It's still fragile. It's still rebuilding itself. And then after that, after you've regained your bearings, that's when you move to the physical therapy. And mm -hmm. for emotions, that's going through the motions of you know, crying about it, writing about it, journaling about it, breathing about it, whatever it is that helps you regain your strength. Because emotional trauma is just like a broken bone or just like needing stitches. And some trauma could be a bruise. And in that bruise, when you touch it, you know, it hurts. Sometimes you don't even see bruises, right? But you know that it's there. And if you, it's, it's sensitive in that area until it heals. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes for emotions. But what do we do? We're like, get over it. Would you say that to somebody in a cast? Would you say that to somebody who had visible scratches on their arm? No, there's a time period that it takes to scab over and everything else that it needs. And the same thing goes with emotions. But if we don't do the work that you need to go through with the emotions, yeah, they plague you until you handle them, right? And then eventually, you're, I call it procrastinating your homework because eventually you have to do it. The longer you procrastinate, you don't remember the subject matter. You just have a pile of stuff you have to do and you need to go backwards, but you're gonna have to do it eventually. And I always, how do I explain? You know, if you have a stomach bug and after you have it, it is all encompassing, you know, it, it feels like health will never happen again. But once that stomach bug is out of your system, you can't have an, even imagine the stomach ache. You can't feel the stomach ache once the stomach ache is gone. Even if you're, you know that that was the worst, but you can't physically feel it because you purged it out of your system, right? Yeah. But with emotions, you could think of a traumatic moment in your life and feel like you're there all over again, no matter how much time has passed. And that's because you never took the time to purge. Mm. And that's why it's so important to feel your emotions in the moment that you're experiencing the trauma so that you're not reverted back to that same moment years later, that you can hear about it without it affecting you physically, mentally, and emotionally, right? And so that's how I explain why emotions are so important in the recovery process. Because if you don't feel your emotions, they end up physically appearing on your body. And so I know that was, <laughs> that's, I, I went on a little bit. <laughs> no, I think that was so great. I mean, when you were saying the analogy of the stomach ache, all I could think about was it sounds like you're describing childbirth. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> the greatest pain brings you the greatest joy, you know, and, and, and do we remember the pain? I mean, yeah, but do we remember it like where we living the childbirth every day? No. However, it's because we're feeling it you know, for the most part in that moment. And I get what you're saying, you know, and that's so important for our listeners to understand and to be aware of just, just feeling your emotions, hearing your emotions, sitting with them, acknowledging our emotions so that they don't get, uh, you know, like swept under the carpet. So they don't get submerged to all of a sudden reemerge at some point later. Absolutely. Because then you live it over and over and over again. Until Not only that. 
And then once you experience them, you'll remember the moment, but you won't experience the moment anymore. And that's what we want. We can't avoid suffering in life. And that's just a part of the human journey. You know, nature goes through it. And I, I explain it like wildly disruptive, right? But the area after the down, um, most fertile. It's the most powerful land. So our emotions are the cue for our nature is and realize that I can't avoid any of it, but all of it is integral to my regeneration and regrowth and expansion as a person. Well, let's talk about what happens to emotions when we're not feeling them, right? When they do get pushed down, how do they manifest themselves into physical? problems with the body? This is such a good question because I work with people, right, with pain management and a lot of the times when I'm doing their acupuncture, because you can diagnose people from everything else, whether they have a stomach ache, a backache, a headache or whatever, I work, if I work on their stress first, I don't even have to go to the areas that address the head, the stomach, the back because they get their emotions that people are like, why am I crying? I'm like, just flow with it. <laughs> just flow with it. Just don't worry about it. You don't have to know why. Just allow it to happen. And then I don't tell them that because it causes more stress to know that you're stressed out. But as they get this vehicle to let their emotions out, they no longer feel the pain. That and that's what it is. In Ayurveda, I think they taught, I read it in one of the Ayurvedic books where they say the mind has longer shelf life than the body, right? But the mind can only hold so much. Right. And so once the mind has held on to something so long as other things that are happening, it now puts itself into your body. So your body is helping you express and release what it is that you've been holding to mentally. And so a lot of and it can come from stomach issues or mm -hmm. chronic illnesses. They can come into all the way into chronic illnesses because if you think about it, if you're constantly in a state of stress, it does a number on Renal glands does a number on your metabolism. Your mind is always in a state of adrenaline. And so your body never has time to actually rest. You're not sleeping well. You're not eating well. And all those things manifest into illness. And mm -hmm. so your body is just beautiful, intelligent thing. that's always on our side. And so it's like, okay, we've been holding on to this. And if I'm in pain, then you'll rest because you desperately need rest. Or if I'm in pain, maybe you'll cry because you need to, or if like, you know, whatever it is. And so I always say when, wherever body pain shows, just hold it. Like, so if your shoulder hurts, like just put your hand on it and be like, what are you trying to tell me? Like, I'm sorry for whatever it is that caused you to get to this. Obviously go to the doctor, whatever you need to do, but understanding like, what does this remind me of? And, and there's really beautiful information on this. And there's always, they call it esoteric meaning. So esoteric meaning, means what is the emotional, spiritual connection to that specific body part. And so lower back is how you hold yourself up, right? So a lot of wounds of self-worth, being safe, being um, accepted, it's all in that area because that's what you hold yourself up in. Wow. And so a lot of people have lower back pain. Why is that? Because a lot of us through our life now, have been comparing ourselves to other, feel like not enough. We're doing jobs that we don't love. We're afraid about money. There's money. In All of that is in our lower back. Our shoulders are literally about taking on other people's issues. You're literally like, you know, when you put pe little kids on your shoulders, so people with pains, I automatically know who are you worried about all the time and what pain are you taking on of people because you're like, oh too much on your shoulders. And as we we work through that just from like a cognitive therapy approach, their shoulders will start to relax. And it's just so much proof that it's interconnected. And so mm. whenever someone's in a lot of pain, I automatically know, oh, you've been dealing with this for a long time. This was just the last end of it for it to express itself. And it's kind of like, um, you know, when they say you go through death, there's stages of grief. Yes. And the last stage, or one of the last stages is anger. Is what? Anger. One of the last stages is anger. Right. Body hurts. Yeah, like anger, right. denial, like all of those different stages. Sure. And then when you're at that anger phase, it's loud. 
you can't you can't avoid it you can't run from it it's it shakes you and that's body pain and so when it gets to body pain i'm like you're ready to heal and people don't understand that when i say that i'm like no listen you're ready to heal the minute it hits your body because it's the last stage of your emotions so let's go through it and get it out while it's presenting itself and so that's it because people think that pain is the first stage, but it's the first stage of the me the physical manifestation mm -hmm. of the problem. It's actually the last the last stage of the longevity of the problem, like the, the last stage of the emotional yes. parts of the problem that you've been taking on emotionally. Now they are manifesting themselves physically. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is amazing. They, I love talking about this because I, I know a lot of what's talked about right now. And I love that, you know, there's so many people like me spearheading that conversation. Of, like, it's okay to feel what you feel. It's okay to be sick. But there's also a long part of feeling like when you're sick, it's punishment, right? Or that you're doing something wrong or you should be embarrassed or whatever. But really when you're sick, it's your body being like, Side. Let's work together and make this happen. I'm going to make sure that you have no other choice but to heal. And yes, it's time out, but maybe timeouts are regrouping so you can take a breath and really work on what's really important. Because yes, everything that we do in our life is incredible, but the way that we feel in our skin is our main mission in life. And when you're sick or when you're in pain, that's when you're giving all yourself that we're giving to others in this abundance group, like, <laughs> like level, like where we so graciously give to others. But when do we really take out to be, to love ourselves, not be selfish, be self-focused. And when you do that, that's when your life begins to change. And when you do that, you give the opportunity to do that. So I kind of love being able to reframe it. So people that can understand like, Oh, I'm ready to heal because once you get sick, it's like, and I, I, for one, I, for one, through that, you know, every time I don't feel well. I think the phone cut out a little bit. What was that last part? You for one what? I for one because when you get it hurts, it hurts everywhere. And you when you get sick, it hurts. Yeah. You can't think of anything. But you can't think of so this is on you. And it's just this bubble of love in yourself. If you choose to do that well, comfortable. And you, you can start and be forever. <laughs> yeah, I th I think your your connection might be a little bit fuzzy because it's going in and out a bit, like the the uh, audio. Um, but I, this is just going to give me a chance to stop and reset the room a bit um, because I'm really excited to have you here with us today. And for any listen listeners that just joins in, we're with Sheil Buta today, and we're talking about untangling trauma and her her programs and processes that give kids the infrastructure to actually manage their emotions. Uh, Sheil has a new book coming out, uh, God willing, later in the fall called Untangling Trauma. And we're just excited to have you here today. So you know what, I I really thought I could, but I, I can't do this entire interview without asking you, especially talking about the body pain. I cannot not ask you about the work that you've done with professional athletes. Uh, Give us a synopsis. Give us like a quick synopsis of, you know, how you got into it, what you did with them. And then I promise we'll move you right into the kids. But I've got to hear it with the audience. I've got to. No, I love it. I love this question because, you know, athletes, they have this incredible gift, right? But they also don't have time to feel a lot of the, what they feel, right? And so, because it's always sports, sports, sports. You do not get to the level of professional athletics unless you've dedicated your whole life to it, right? And so at some point, you've sacrificed a part of your childhood into just playing. And yes, it's fun and yes, it's joyful. But when you know you're on a track, it's also work. And so when I work with professional athletes, it's been so rewarding because I've worked with, you know, NFL players, NBA, um, MLB, NHL. And so it's such, it's incredible because athletes also maintain child like passion for life, right? And so when I work on them, 
they actually have the most incredible results. We do acupressure, we do breath work. We definitely go through emotions while working on the body stuff, but they heal so much quicker. And I always noticed that. And I was like, why is that? Why is that that athletes have the most, like the quickest turnaround rate per se, right? And so it was like, I was like, oh, it's because they're following their passion. They are living their purpose. They are doing the things they need to do. And they're always in this desire to get better. And so I love working with them and I love giving them a space to kind of slow down, to feel what they feel and like untangle, right? Untangle a lot of the stuff that they didn't even know was tangled, right? And so, you know, one of the NFL players that I worked with, um, where is he now? I don't know. Um, but we, we were talking and I forget what came up. And I was like, why do you feel the need to like make everything funny. I was like, something was, you know, that, that sounded like it sucked a little bit, you know, that, that wasn't fun. That, that sounds like, and I was like, you know, you're allowed to, you know, be that you're allowed to say that that hurt your feelings. It's, you're allowed to say that wasn't okay. You're allowed to say, and it doesn't have to be angry, right? Like it can just be like, yeah, dude, I actually hated that. That wasn't okay. Like it's gonna be like, oh, you know, and he just looked at me and he started to tear up and he's like, I don't think that I was ever like given permission to like feel that, right? Because what they do is they're like, take it out on the football field or, you know, whatever it may be. And so I love having this space and whether it be an hour or two hours, some of my sessions last a little bit longer to be able to slow them down and go through that and feel what they feel and realize there were areas that are a little bit more problematic because they weren't allowed to, for this per specific person, feel vulnerable because they had to just, they had to, at some level, they learned, oh my gosh, just take it all in and use it on the field. I'm going to be a better player. And I was like, listen, bud, why don't we, you already have the skill set. Let's take out the intense emotion because then you'll have more clarity of mind so that you make more strategic moves instead of adrenaline aggression moves because you're more likely to get hurt then. And so he actually ended up playing so much better when we started taking out the emotional factor to his playing. Wow. And so it's really cool to work with that. And with the fighter I worked with, you know, we talked about that too. It was like, look, I don't know what, like what you went through and a lot of times they'll talk about it. And, you know, it's wonderful to be in a space where they can cry to me. And obviously there's a lot of, um, I, I respect their privacy, you yeah. know, have this incredible moment of intimacy with men that never that you see that look like they have it all together that their lives are perfect they, they get idealized they're set on a stage from a young age right you always know who's going to go pro and so they're they, to give them a chance to feel that and go through those motions has been so special and like to see the results on the the, the court or the field or the ring or rink or whatever it's it's just, I don't know, euphoric, right? To realize that connection and to be able to help them and, you know, things like mindfulness that they're like, look, this is fluff. Look, I don't want to do this. And I'm like, listen, we're not going to go into the whole woo-woo mindfulness. Like, I'm just going to teach you how to breathe so that you can slow down time. Because when you breathe, you actually get more out of your minute, right? Like, I explain it like kind of like, think of how long a minute is when you put something in the microwave. It is so long, <laughs> right? Great. But why does it? go by so quickly when you're sitting yeah. there in a class you don't like it and so I was like when you breathe when we focus on our breath when we do our breath work when you are in a situation that is like I'll call it crisis management right like you you're down whatever you know the the clock is running out and you need to make some moves quickly if in that moment you're not going on a stress level and you're going on a strategic level because you've slowed down your breath and you've trained your mind to breathe in instead of go into this um, danger mode, you're going to be able to make better decisions in this, in this, um, during the game. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm meshing. All no, sure. Exactly. That makes such perfect sense. And it's been great. You know, they don't get hurt as often, right? Because they're making better decisions. They're moving mm -hmm easier, right? They're not stiffening up at the middle of the game because they're stressed. They don't have their jaw clenched. They don't have any of this. They're just enjoying the game. And when your body's loose, you're less likely to get hurt. And it's the same thing as, and I don't recommend this, but you know, when they say like people, unfortunately, during car accidents that like, you know, um, drinking and driving or whatever, their body is very like limp. So they don't like get hurt. So there's, there's definitely a connection 
to be able to calm your body down so that you don't get hurt during high impact. And so to be able to get them to tap into that space through their breath, through their mind, then they're able to have that longevity in their career, even though they're getting hurt. Because every hit in sports is like a car accident coming at you. Absolutely. Such impact to the body. But I love that getting them to calm the mind so that they can make better decisions, even in a fast paced environment mm -hmm. like during a game. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And I work on the pressure points because pressure points are really incredible. I love doing it with kids and everything because you can heal like this is your neck. This is your neck right here. And so pushing on a pressure point, um, there's different when you know, it's your pressure point, it will hurt. Even if you just dab on it, it'll hurt. So you can diagnose through that. And so I'll push on the pressure points. And since they hurt really bad, a lot of emotions come out. And so we work on the physical body, but it's the emotional stuff that I think I do with them that helps them relax and get their confidence back and everything else that I think has the most results. That's amazing. So how does this translate to the work that you do with kids? Because it seems like it's the other end of the spectrum, but it's really not it's all the same, right? Like it's all the same because athletes, while it's work, it was a it's a game. It's a game they're playing. And they're just playing at this like Literally. high level that it, it's no, it's no longer just for fun. It's their right. career. And, but it is, it, it should never lose the fun. And if you think about kids and the life that they lead, it's for fun. And that's their work. That's their literal work is to have fun. Their literal work, going back to Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's their literal work to enjoy life and experience life and play and be able to think about when kids get so quick. Like they can, they can nap or be hurt. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I was just checking in the comments. Oh. We have a couple of people commenting, like great topic, like really oh, yeah. enjoying it. Very nice. And thank you to our listeners again. Thank so, you. I think we just people living, and that's what children, children don't second guess what they're doing with them. No, it's just made me really run towards it with full force, and I think we go towards people that feel alive. Yes, I think that we're supposed to live, and I think that reminder keeps me feeling alive, keeps me grounded. No, hey, Alex, don't get me wrong. I'm tired. I go to bed at seven sometimes when it's like every day with children. And but I go to bed happy. And everything I do changes because the way that I reflect on things happening shifts. Think about things from the adult perspective. Things have so much more weight. When you think of things from a kid's perspective, you're like, oh whatever. <laughs> you're like, oh, what are you going through? Right? Like it's, just, it's fine. And so you're able to move forward. And I remember you know, with kids, like they taught me just so much. I was like, you know, when kids are having a bad day, they're really mean to you. They are mean, but you don't take it personally, right? Like, but when an adult is mean to you, you take it so personally. But when it, when I was working with kids and especially the foster kids and they would, you know, act up, I'm like, why are you being so mean to me? And I'd find out, you know, they went on a visit with their birth parent and the birth parent didn't show up. And so they were causing just world war three with me. And so it shifted me because I'm a sensitive person as someone that loves as deeply as I do. And I just notice everyone. I'm a nurturer. I yes, also, nurturer. you are a nurturer. Thank you. So are you actually, but it's very, um, heartbreaking when yeah. you see other people are not nurturers and mm -hmm. it took being around children for me to say, Oh, this wasn't about me. What were you going through today? And even with waiters, something that's simple, when I have a waiter that comes up to me that's rude, before maybe I'd be like, ew, like I'm, I'm paying to be here. And now I'm like, oh, I wonder what they went through today. And so I'll smile more at them and I'll be like, oh, like how's your day going? And now every single time the waiter ends up coming up after they've been rude and they're like, you know, I'm so sorry, I'm having such a rough day. It's been a weird day. And I'm like, no, that's okay. Like we're here. Thank you. Like for whatever. And it's, Look how quickly you're able to shift a person when you're not judging them and giving back the same anger to them or not taking it personally. And I'm able to understand people better. So like not everybody is like a walking care pair like me and they're not supposed to be. It's weird that I'm like this and I like being like this. It's my purpose. We love it. We love it. 
Thank you. But it's also great that 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 you're disrupting that pattern. It's not like you're not dishing it back to the waiter or waitress, but you're also not dishing it to the next person that crosses your path. Yeah. Just stop it in your tracks. You know, people very rarely get up and they're like, I want to mess everyone's day up, right? Like they they don't. Like, no, they, and if they do, I want to know who taught you that. Like, I think there's a much deeper issue. And when we stop needing to fight back and we start being curious, going back to kids, when we start just being curious as to why you're behaving that way, you're able to not just heal yourself in that moment because I'm not creating, going back to the very beginning, I'm not creating an opinion about humanity. I'm not creating an opinion about that person. You sure. are. I'm creating a place of compassion and space for that person to be able to unwind. And it could be a two second interaction or two hours or maybe two days, right? But in that moment, that person felt seen and heard so that they're able to unpack it so that they don't go on in this like tornado to everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm able to help them unwind that so they be can become their eye of the storm. And then I get to be healed in that moment knowing I'm that wasn't about me. I don't have to hold that from the rest of my life. Because there are so many things people say to you when you're a kid, going back to kids, that you hold on to for the rest of your forever. forever. Always. And it's so important how we talk to children. You know, I heard in a clubhouse room this morning that by the time a child is a certain age, they hear thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the word no. And think about that. Like that really stopped me in my tracks. Mm -hmm when I heard that. So, you know, what we say to children, to your point, it's so important. And we really, don't, really need to be so aware. I love that you said that. And I think that's a really, I wasn't even going to bring up that point. That's a really important point is that we really like, because I said so, it needs to be stripped out of our vocabulary because kids don't know why no. Right? And like, imagine it from a kid's point of view, right? Like they don't know why running with knives are bad, or they don't know why I shouldn't be jumping off this table. Yeah, okay. you're worried about their safety. But being able to take that moment and explain it to them and sit with them and reframe it, you're helping them understand that the world's not against them, right? Because in their head, the way they filtered that interaction is like, why is everyone getting in the way of my joy? Right? Like that's what they feel in that moment. Right. But you know, I have to ask you only because you just said, you know, take a minute, sit down. Like what happens if it's in the middle of a parent's work day and the parent really doesn't have time in that moment because there's something else that's going on that need, that's that they're in the process of addressing and they can't literally explain all of that in that moment. What do you think the words are? Like, what is that script? What does that look like? What does it sound like? I think it's the everyday journey one with kids, right? And so setting, being able to talk to them every single day, develop a conversation style with your kid, because that's not going to happen overnight, but start talking to them when you're not wor working. So that's like the first <laughs> step is start talking to them when you're not working, start engaging with them, help them develop their own communication style, help respect when they're speaking. Because then they'll know I have to respect when you're speaking and being able to really help them understand like, okay, when mommy and daddy or whatever your, your name is in that moment, when you're speaking to listen, I think eye contact is really important. So now when you're at a moment, when you're doing work and they're acting crazy because toddlers and kids do, you know, they're just doing stuff, being yes. able to say, hey, that's not okay. You know, I used to say to kids, you know, when they were younger, I'd say that's an owie. Like that hurts mm -hmm. feelings. That's an owie. And they understood what that meant. I was like, that hurts Ms. Shields feelings. Right now, I can't tell you, but let's talk about it later. But right now, can you go do this instead? Yeah. And we'll talk about it. But understanding those key phrases, I had to talk to them to understand. I'm not intimidating. That is one thing I learned as a preschool teacher. These kids would literally laugh at me when I would yell at them. I'm not even, I like, didn't know what to do. And anarchy is real with children. When you have 14 little critters and, the, and it's just, I was like, I don't know what to do. Kids are kicking each other in the face. They're hyper, they're all over the place. I was like, what do I, what do, I do? And then one day I had them all sit crisscross applesauce, the whole class. I just had them sit down in a line and I was like, you guys hurt Ms. Shields' feelings. 
not one kid moved a muscle. But when I yelled at that, well, not yelled, but I was like, that's, an, you know, the, like, I was like, we yeah. can't. What if the kids actually said to me, Miss Sheila, you're so cute when you're mad. What do you even do with that? What do you do with that? <laughs> like, I, I, I was like, I'm never, I'm, I'm done. I can't believe I'm, they knew how to say that. I can't believe that they knew to say that. I've had it. Kids, they were just like, this is so cute when you're mad. I remember the exact face. And like, I was like, what do I, what do I do? What do I do in this moment? But they respect it, right? right? And so I created the dynamic of them knowing like, Miss Shield's so much fun. I'll play, I'll do this. But when you step out of line or you start misbehaving or not listening or yeah. whatever, your day's gonna get a lot less fun. I'm not punishing you, but I'm helping you understand, okay, then we have, to, I can't let you run free because you're running into directions that you're not listening. So until your ears are on again, we're gonna be quiet. And that was things that we would talk about at that mm -hmm. age. So to your point, it is very important to build that rapport poor ahead of time. Mm -hmm. so you're constantly speaking with your child and that they know that in any given moment that if you can't discuss something with them, it's because you can't, not because you won't, and that you can always talk about it later, which I think is an ideal time to pause just to mention the American Society for the Positive Care of Children has on their website a free downloadable app called the Happy Child app, which is one of the most incredible apps ever. And just, you know, for you to know, Sheil, and just for our audience members to know, this app is incredible because it helps to develop that conversation with your child so that you can build a lifetime of happiness, not just teach your child for those quick fix happiness Know, happiness fixes that can lead to something more dangerous later in life, but really how to, you know, communicate, self-soothe, to help parents and caregivers understand how that delicate forming child's brain develops. Mm. So download the Happy Child app to all of our listeners and great segue into what programs do you have that help emotional to develop emotional intelligence with children so there's i developed the wide range of them because there's no one size fits all and i learned that being a preschool teacher not every kid listens the same way and not every kid absorbs the same way and they call it like a divergent learner right the kids learn in so many different like are you a listener or are you a doer whatever mm -hmm. um and so i I develop different stages of mindfulness, right? So I do emotional freedom tap, EFT, I do tapping, but I explain what it is we're doing. And I have a conversation with them because I don't want it to ever be boring. And so we do that. We do yoga with affirmations and I'll make it really simple. We do breath work with affirmations. And then for the younger kids with the breath work, I'll help them understand emotions with different types of breathing. Like, how do you breathe when you're angry? How do you breathe? And so we'll go through that. And then while they're in this state of angst, right, where I get them through their breath, I'm like, does that feel good? And the like, so what do we do? If this emotion is for hurting. What do we do when we're hurting? And then I'll help them figure out a different breath work pattern that feels calmer or whatever else. So that when they're angry, they can remember like, oh, I was breathing this way with Miss Sheil mm -hmm. and I, I I could turn it down by going into this. And so like, even with kids that um had a lot more intensity in their emotions, I let them feel what they feel. Cause I think that's really important too. When you have a kid that's more intense and that's okay. They're more passionate and it's going to be beautiful when they grow up. But while they're younger, you know, as adults, we are teaching children, which emotions are fire, right? Like we teach kids don't touch fire because it burns. We're teaching them at what level will your emo emotional reactions burn you? Like that's your job as a caretaker, right? And so I help them feel what they feel, but then we start unwinding that to what do you do when you're in this state? So I used to like have kids, we jump up and down or whatever. And then we're like, okay, what do we do to, what do we do to relax? What feels relaxing? And I teach them what relax even means. Cause we, we take for granted that a lot of these words don't mean anything to these children. And so like, I'll be like, what does that mean? I was like, how do you feel yeah. when you're on the beach? Some kids hate it. Right. So that's not their happy place and understanding what the kid's happy place is. So we do that. 
I do activities with them to understand like what what are things that are healing for them? What are things that are nurturing for them? And we we do arts and crafts with it and we we go through it and I do activities for their back to back and we match breath work. And so it's it's fun. It's an interactive playtime where they're learning really profound emotional lessons. And when they're older, I make it more fun and I make them group activities and I talk about real life things and I make it funny, but then we go into an activity of understanding it. And so it's, it's been really rewarding. I feel like every time I do a new class, I learn a new activity. So I'm like, oh, that's going to not work. I need, I need to wing it in this moment because these kids were not having it. And being able to just move with it because my my source is the same. So as long as my source lesson is the same, I can figure out any curriculum for it, you know? And so it's so great. I love how customized, like it's, it's a program, yet it's customized for each child. Because like you said, every child's happy place isn't the same exact spot. Mm-hmm. Every child's preference isn't the same. Right. Some children are more outgoing. Some are more introverted. Some like to finger pain. Others don't like to get messy. But there are other things that they enjoy. I love that. Exactly. I love that you said because some kids literally have an anxiety attack with their hands. But other kids, the messiness calms them down from the anxiety that they're feeling mentally. And so being able to acknowledge that and know that not one size fits all and like translate your subject matter so that the communication hits for them. Right. And I feel like we, we, we sometimes fail as that and that as adults. Right. And I realized that when I was, you know, a preschool teacher, when I work with kids, like one kid time, if I told them that they couldn't go to dance, if they continued what they did for doing, they would jump for joy. Other kids, when they were in timeout, loved it. Like they loved it. They loved being in the corner. They just had the time of their life reading the book. I'm like, okay, now I got to figure out what's a, what's a punishment. You know what I mean? Because there is that aspect of um, caretaking. And so being able to know, like, how do I communicate so that you understand my, my, what is it? My objective is not to just say what I'm saying. My objective is for you to absorb what it is I'm trying to tell you and being able to tell to you in the way that you hear me. And like understanding that person to person really helped me in developing this program and being able to create a bridge between kids that are wonderfully different, you know, and unique, beautiful and eccentric and whatever else. Mm -hmm. How do you create a bridge between that is through focusing on things that are the same. We all feel that no matter what makes us sad, we all feel that and that compassion is the same. And the way to go through that, because I realized that when I was working with kids, it was like the coolest thing I had kids set back to back. I had a really hyper kid and I had a really like kid and I put them back to back and I was like, check his breath. And the one kid that was like slower, he's like, oh my God. I was like, I felt like he was breathing. So, cause he was feeling the difference in his energy through his breath and through that and being able to have kids in yeah. small cues and other people so that they knew how to talk to them, but they also saw that they were synergistic. The two opposites were actually really good for each other because they helped each other create a balance through their two. But what happens usually is you go towards people that are more like you, but there's no growth in that. So I was able to teach them like, look, you actually do have a commonality with them. And that person was able to help you because they helped you do things that were natural to you and being able different kids together that way is just I love it I <laughs> love how you're you're crossing borders with the children right you're you're facilitating new friendships because you're finding commonalities that are not based on hey you're athletic I'm athletic you're in the band I'm in the band it's actually based on feeling and compassion yeah is to me One of the most beautiful things in the world is that you're fostering compassion among today's youth. Love it. I I love everything that you're doing. So tell us, how can we as caregivers, as parents, as teachers, how can we help foster, you know, this ongoing emotion? How can we make, you know, help make things okay with the children? How can we help them to express themselves. 
in better ways? How can we help them communicate? You know, I don't, I would love to give this like quick fix answer to that. I know. There's not, it, I think the one, the one single most important thing is to make sure one, you're calm when you're engaging with like, do your self work, do your work so that you have the mental capacity to hold space for children while they're feeling a wide range of untapped wow. potential, right? Wow. And, and we fall, we're human, but the thing is our humanness greatly damages children because they don't have the wherewithal to understand that adults are flawed because they look at us as superhumans. And so it's our job to take the initiative to take a beat when we're having a bad day, create space and communicate it to kids when we're having a bad day. I work with parents all the time about like, do you apologize to your kids when you have a bad day? Do you like explain it to them when you're having a bad day? Or do you just like let it fly? Because that's how you're going to teach them to apologize too when they're that it's one okay that their emotions can you know get the best of them sometimes we're all human but it's also important to apologize and communicate it and so to be able to trust your kid to understand you or your student or your patient or whatever it is to understand you and communicate it as you're going through it because you lead by example so like with the kids I worked with like you know I have multiple sclerosis so there's days that I don't feel well so like I'll explain it to the kids like you know Right now, like I actually feel a little bit tired and played instead, you know, because it's always play. I never say we're, we're playing. Would it be okay if we sat down? They're like, okay, you know, and I'm like, well, why are you tired? Or why are you this? Why are you coughing? Why are you? And I'll explain it to them what's going on with me. I take extra time to be able to simplify everything I'm going through, because it's good for me to know and it's good for them. And so to be able to create a space of safety, communication is the best way to know that they'll trust you to communicate themselves, right? And so- Just being authentic, creating that space of safety and communication, that's so important. I, You know what, I cannot wait to have you back on the show <laughs> as your programs progress. I love the work that you're doing. Where can our viewers find you? On Instagram, I believe. Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I am on Facebook. Instagram is the best way to reach me. I'm very good about answering messages. I'm rebuilding my website. I'm redoing all that. That should be up by the end of the week. So that will be shieldbuta.com. But all of my stuff is on Instagram. You can find me on that. That has a link to everything else. But tell, us about your new, tell us about your new infographic. Oh. Where to find it because that was amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I created an in infographic for parents and teachers or whoever else. And honestly, it's good for adults to do too, which has always been my thing. I was like, let me make this so that whoever is teaching the kid also benefits from it. And so it's four ways to healing your feelings. And so the infographic is just like a little, very short step-by-step, -step, which is the base of what I do with children. I expand on it, but honestly, just that basic of being able to communicate communicate in a safe space because we don't want to judge anybody for what they're feeling. We shouldn't judge ourselves. If we're feeling sad, it shouldn't be like, I'm so mad that you're feeling sad. Get snap out of it. It's just, I feel sad. Okay. That's okay. That is the first step or angry or whatever. That's okay. I, that's the first step is that's okay. What is it? Acknowledge it. The second step is once you've acknowledged it is to take a seat with each other, sit down, and breathe. Just focus on your breath. Take deep breaths. Inhale for four. Exhale for eight, six. Whatever. There always has to be a longer exhale because that stimulates the relaxation into your body. I inhale for four and exhale for eight. But as long as the exhale is longer and count it. And after you've done a few breaths, focus on the actual sensations of your skull. And do that with a child. Sit down and be like, what are you feeling? But you don't have to communicate it. You just have to guide it. Like, I'm going to feel what I'm feeling in my crown. We call it our crown. So what am I feeling in my head? How does my brain feel about what I'm feeling? And take a moment to just experience that, whether that be a minute, whatever is good. If you have a hyper kid, don't spend too long because they're going to be mad. And then after you have it here, forever that feels right. 
as long as you can, do you feel tingliness? Like prompt them with that, but don't ask them to express it because their job in that moment is to just feel it, not express yeah, it. In that express it. Beautiful. And then you go to your heart and then you put your hands on your heart and you say, I am safe. I am loved. And you ask them to just breathe into their heart. And then after they do that, that's when you start communicating. How do you feel now? And what do you need? And if you, I like to keep my hand on my heart that whole time and say, okay, what do you need? Close your eyes. What do you want right now? And then create a game plan off of that. Do you, are you hungry? Cause sometimes it's as simple as that with kids, you know, do you need a hug? Do you need to go outside? Do you need, and have, and then write it down, right? Afterwards, I always write it down because those are things that the kids have now identified as their nurturing sure. toolbox. Yeah, I love it. Thank you for sharing that with us. Amazing, amazing gems and golden nuggets that you've shared with us today. Thank you so much, Shiel. So just um, for anybody who wants to get a hold of Shiel, just follow her on Instagram. Really, she posts such great things she, uh, at Shiel Buta. And also look for her upcoming book, Untangling Trauma. We're so excited about that for you. It's going to be packed with such wisdom and really important stuff to teach our kids. So thank you again for being with us here today to unpack uh, and untangle trauma. So if you are looking for more resources like this, please visit our learning center. I told you a little bit earlier about the Happy Child app. Also, if there is someone in your community who is making an incredible difference with families and children like Sheila is doing, then please contact us at info at americanspcc.org. That's info at americanspcc.org. And just continue to join us on Wednesdays at two o'clock because we have some amazing, amazing upcoming guests. So again, thank you, Sheil. You've been phenomenal. You are so selfless in what you give of yourself, not only to your to the athletes, to the children, but to us as listeners as well. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work you do. And I love that there's an organization like this because it's so important. And thank you for the resources you provide. I wish this existed when I was a kid, but I'll be sure to share it with everyone I know and all my parent friends. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Oh, we can't wait to have you back. Hang on one second. I'm just going to end the room and tell everybody again, we're here every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Why? Because a better future starts here.